I'm the Assistant Vice President for Collections and Research and the Withrow Farney Curator of Vertebrate Paleontology here at Museum Center. Tonight we have another installment in our Insights Lecture Series, and it's my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, a scientist working on the cutting edge of geological discovery and about which you'll hear tonight. Uh, but before I introduce him, uh, a little bit of housekeeping, I want to remind you to please fill out the surveys that you should have received upon entering tonight. Uh, and that will help us continually improve the lectures as we go forward. So thank you for that. Stores. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Collections and Research and the Withrow Farney Curator of Vertebrate Paleontology here at Museum Center. Tonight we have an another installment in our Insights Lecture Series. And it's my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, a scientist working on the cutting edge of geological discovery and about which you'll hear tonight. Uh, but before I introduce him, uh, a little bit of housekeeping, I want to remind you to please fill out the surveys that you should have received upon entering tonight. Uh, and that will help us continually improve the lectures as we go forward. So thank you for that. Uh, also, uh, while there will be a question and answer session uh, at the end of tonight's lecture, please wait for the microphone to be brought to you so that everybody can, can benefit from your question. Tonight, we'll hear from Dr. Kyle Straub uh, on a subject that should appeal to everyone, our own Earth. Uh, he'll help us explore the challenges and, and methods uh, that geologists are currently developing in order to read the grand story of the history of the Earth through individual rock layers and the discipline of stratigraphy. While we lack a Rosetta Stone for uh, reading this rock record, we are fortunate that Dr. Straub and his uh, colleagues are continuously working at, at piecing together the story. Dr. Straub attended Pennsylvania State University, uh, from which he graduated in 2002, and earned a PhD in geology and geochemistry from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2007, uh, after which he accepted a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Center for Earth Sur Surface Dynamics. Dr. Straub is now the Ken and Ruth Arnold Early Career Professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Tulane University, with research interests in experimental sedimentology, quantitative stratigraphy, submarine morphodynamics, and seismic geomorphology. Save your questions for the microphone. Uh, Dr. Straub is the author of numerous peer-reviewed uh, research papers and was given the James Lee Wilson Award for Excellence in Sedimentary Geology by a younger geoscientist at the 2013 Annual Meeting of the Society for Sedimentary Petrology. He's a distinguished lecturer in the GeoPrisms program, and we want to thank the University of Cincinnati Department of Geology uh, for co-sponsoring Dr. Straub and making tonight's lecture a reality. So the title of Dr. Straub's talk this evening, Stratigraphy, a Flawed Record of Earth's History, but the best one we have. And without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kyle Straub. lights down a little bit, but uh, um, hopefully this works for everyone. Uh, let me just start off by saying um, thanks for the invitation to come uh, speak at the lecture series here. Um, it's a real honor and uh, hope I look forward to tonight and um, hope that everybody enjoys this. Um, so as was, uh, as was said, the title here um, that the, we're going to be moving through with the lecture tonight is basically um, what I'm going to be trying to do is explain to you what stratigraphy is. Um, and how we as scientists try to use this discipline of stratigraphy to try to say something about the Earth's history. But one of the big points that I'm going to try to, to make um, is that while we have a record of Earth's history that's stored in these layers of sediment um, and sedimentary rocks that we call stratigraphy, um, the record has flaws in it. Um, there are gaps in the record uh, and a number of other different processes that make this record very challenging for us to be able to interpret Earth's history um, from, uh, from these layers of sedimentary rock. So before I get going, um, I'm going to just mention a couple of points about uh, an organization that I'm involved in um, that is largely responsible for bringing me to Cincinnati tonight. Um, and that program is a program that is called Geo, um, GeoPrisms here. Um, it's a program that is funded by the National um, Science Foundation. 
Um, and basically what this program is, is it's a collection of scientists, mainly geologists, who are interested in understanding um, uh, essentially plate tectonics on the Earth's surface. So what I mean by that is, let's just uh, take some cross-section here of what the Earth looks like. And as um, some of you might uh, know from um, uh, education that you might have had, oops, going back here, education that you might have had uh, earlier in your lives, um, the Earth here basically works in a way where uh, we have large forces within inside the Earth that cause crustal movements to go on through time, the, the crust, the surface of the Earth that we live on here. And there are some locations where that crust ends up diving and goes down deep into the Earth, into the Earth's mantle and down into the core. Um, and associated with that, there are regions here where we push up big mountain belts. Um, in addition to that, there's uh, um, locations similar to uh, um, where I live in New Orleans, where we have big river deltas that are carrying a lot of sediment in rivers um, moving through uh, these delta environments that drop out sediment that create big, large deposits of um, stratigraphy that we're able to read the Earth's history from. And so geoprisms is basically, it's a, you know, a large collection of geologists um, that are funded by the government, so it's, it's funded by everybody here who's in the room who's a taxpayer, um, to try to understand these processes um, and basically understand the processes that shape our Earth's surface um, and that can tell us something about our Earth's his, um, history. And importantly for the Earth's history, um, you know, we're facing now um, climate change that is going on, um, and what we are trying to do as a part of geoprisms is read the record of the, the Earth's history in stratigraphy to help inform us about what type of climate change we might be experiencing in the future and how the Earth's surface is going to respond to that climate change. Okay? So that's, that's um, the community that I'm largely a part of here. And you can see um, a large portion of its mission statement is understanding how, um, how this uh, uh, discipline called stratigraphy uh, works um, and uh, what that means for the evolution of the Earth. OK. Uh, I'm going to just switch past this, because I think I've already said everything that I wanted to say there. OK, so I'm a sedimentologist and a stratigrapher. What, is, what does that mean? Basically, what this means is that I'm interested in how um, sediment moves through things like rivers, um, moves through the ocean, and eventually gets deposited at different locations on the Earth's surface. And so here's a, a, an image that I find a, a relatively fun image um, to show people, um, which basically is what the Earth would look like if we did not have any sedimentary cover on it, okay, if we didn't have any loose particles of sediment that were covering different locations of the Earth's surface. Um, and basically what you could see here is if we didn't have um, sediment on the Earth, all these locations that are um, sort of a light blue here would be locations that would be underneath the water. A, a large, large, large um, percentage of the Earth's surface here, 70% um, or so of the Earth's surface is covered with sediment. And this sediment essentially um, was deposited by things like rivers that are moving around on the, uh, on the Earth's surface, or sediment that was blown by air. Um, think about the Sahara and all the sand dunes that you have there. Um, and this sediment um, ends up being very, very important for us to be able to interpret what has gone on in Earth's history. Um, so what do I mean by uh, stratigraphy and, and these layers of rocks and how we're able to, um, to use these layers of rocks to tell us something about Earth's history? Well, what we have here, what I'm showing here is a cross-section of the Earth. Um, this is a, a cross-section that we have of the Earth um, from something that I'm going to call a seismic line. Essentially what you see here is an image here where up here is the Earth's surface and as you go down in this image here, basically you're going down into the Earth. You're going down through the crust um, and uh, starting to approach the mantle here. Um, but basically what you see in this image, it's sort of like a large CAT scan of the Earth's interior. And this CAT scan that we have, we collect these, uh, um, these sort of pseudo CAT scans by having boats that go out into the ocean and they shoot off really large sound waves and we listen for the return of these sound waves as they penetrate through the Earth's surface, ping off of different layers of rocks that are in the subsurface that um, is, uh, uh, you know, stratigraphy, layers of rock, um, and they come back up to, um, to the Earth's surface where we record them. 
But here in this CAT scan, you can see a, a large number of layers of um, uh, sort of the Earth's subsurface here. And these layers are basically arranged in a number of different ways. In this location, the um, sort of stacking pattern of layers that we can see in this CAT scan is related to past changes that we have experienced on the Earth for sea level. Um, the, ocean, uh, the world's sea level um, has varied uh, um, in Earth's history. Uh, let's, see, let's say going back 20,000 years ago, the Earth's sea level was approximately about 120 meters lower than what it is today. Um, so the Earth's sea level has gone up and down through time. Here's a, a graph going back um, from the present day conditions back 500 million years ago. Um, and this is our present knowledge of what we have for what we think sea level has done in the past. And so sea level has bounced around here through time, and that changes in sea level ends up imprinting itself in these layers of rock by causing different types of organization of, um, of these layers. And that, that essentially is the record that we have that we're able to basically move through and try to tear apart to say something about what has been going on in the Earth's um, surface over, let's just say, the last 500 million years here, um, and how exactly has you know, the Earth responded to past changes in climate? Okay. So what do I mean by this record, and what types of questions really are um, people who are sedimentologists and stratigraphers trying to answer through going out to the field, let's just say, um, maybe out to uh, some location where you can see layers of rock exposed, um, maybe out in mountain belts that you could go out to in the western United States, or also these seismic lines that I showed in the, uh, um, in the last record. What types of, of questions are we after? Well, I'm just going to give a couple of examples of really, you know, the, the types of questions that we're trying to address. Um, in the stratigraphy community right now. And one of them here that I'll highlight is a, uh, a publication that was recently, this past year, I believe, um, it was published in the, in the journal Nature, which is a highly respected um, journal in, um, in the scientific community. But basically, this, um, this article that was published from some colleagues of mine, um, what they were doing was they were looking at fluvial rocks, just what that means, fluvial just means rocks that were deposited by rivers that are moving around on the Earth's surface. Those um, rivers are carrying sediment that can eventually drop out and turn into um, sedimentary rocks. But essentially what they were doing here is they were looking at some, um, some layers of rock that were deposited at a time period in the Earth's past um, that was at, you know, let's just say here, it's something that's called the Paleo-Eocene boundary um, in, uh, in Earth's history. But this time period in Earth's history was associated with a dramatic, rapid change in climate, a rapid warming of climate that happened for reasons that we're not exactly certain of. Um, but we do know that over this, um, this boundary that we had here, there was a dramatic, very, very rapid warming of the climate. And so we're interested in going out and studying locations like this where we get maybe some proxy geochemical records by going out and looking at the rocks. And we're also looking just at what the rocks look like to tell us how rivers adjusted to this really, really rapid increase in, in temperature on the Earth's surface as a proxy to basically tell us, okay, if, um, if people who are in the International Panel for Climate Change are correct in their predictions of the amount of warming that we're going to experience in the next hundred years, what types of ways are, um, is uh, um, basically, how is, how is the Earth's surface going to adjust to that climate change? So that's one type of question that we look at. Another type of question that we look at using um, the stratigraphic record is um, basically we're trying to pin down how, uh, um, how biology has changed over the course of the Earth's history. So um, there's you know, a, a lot of intermingling um, in geology between people um, who are really interested in biology and people who are really interested just in the physical processes um, that are left behind in the rock record. But the people who are really interested in, in the um, biology are you know, the people who we would term paleontologists. And you think about um, the uh, field of paleontology that many of you might be um, knowledgeable of, and that would be people who are going out and hunting for dinosaurs, right? Um, but there's also a large amount of paleontologists who are interested in, um, you know, basically other forms of life and how they have evolved in the Earth's history. 
And so what I'm showing up here for a diagram just to highlight some work that the stratigraphic community is really trying to, um, to nail down here is as vegetation or you know, biology on the Earth's surface evolved through time, how did that affect what rivers looked like through Earth's history? So we, we have a diagram here basically um, uh, on this diagram, this side of the diagram over here on the left is very, very, very old rocks, going back again about 500 million years and going up towards the present on here. And one of the things that we know as geologists and as paleontologists um, basically is that around, let's just say, um, the beginning of a time period here that we're going to call the Devonian in the Earth's past, we had a time period where all of a sudden we went from having no land plants um, around, uh, basically all of the biology was going on in the world's oceans, to a time period here at the Devonian where all of a sudden we started to get vegetation on the Earth's surface. Now having this vegetation, you just think about trees and um, you know, different types of grasses, ended up causing a really big change in what rivers looked like on the Earth's surface. Um, you all here are um, situated right along the Ohio River, um, moving down to, to the, the Mississippi River that flows down to where I live. Um, well, prior to this time period in the Devonian, when there was no land plants around, one of the things that we found is that all of the rivers that we see in the stratigraphic record, all of these rock outcrops that we go and look at, they were all deposited by a type of river that we call a braided river. A braided river is a river that is very, very wide, but not that deep, and it doesn't have many bends in the river. Okay. Here, um, you know, the, the Ohio River that you're all used to dealing with here, um, it's a type of river more that we would call a meandering river on here. Basically, it's a, a, a much less wide river, it's much deeper, and the river takes many channel bends in it. And the reason that essentially we have those types of rivers is that vegetation, trees, and grasses along the banks of rivers help to stabilize the river um, and help basically to develop through so there's a very, very tight coupling between vegetation and what the Earth's surface looks like that we've been able to figure out largely through looking at, at old rocks, right? This, these layerings of, uh, of rocks that we call stratigraphy. Okay. Another type of question that we're using this record for, this stratigraphic record for, um, is again, as I said, to, to try to understand how um, rivers change through time and they evolve and respond to different changes in um, different changes in things like sea level um, or different climatic changes. And so to give you an example from where I live, um, I live in New Orleans right in here in one of the bends of the Mississippi River. And as many of you might have heard, um, Louisiana is losing a massive amount of land um, every year. Uh, it's said right now that in Louisiana we lose, every hour we lose one football field's worth of land to the sea. And that goes on for a couple of different reasons. One of those reasons um, that we're losing land is sea level is slowly starting to rise. But in addition to that, land here on the delta um, is, is doing something that we call subsidence. Um, it's uh, essentially the land is sinking into the ocean under its own weight. Um, and so due to those two forces, we're losing land and we're, that's, um, that problem is being exasperated because of the fact that we have the Mississippi River that moves through here. And what we want to do to make the, uh, the land relatively habitable um, in New Orleans is we want to protect against big floods, right? And so to protect against these big floods, we make really big um, levees for the river. Um, and that stabilizes the Mississippi River in one location, but what that also means is that the river is never during a flood able to get out of its channel banks and deposit sediment on the delta top to help fight against this land loss. So on this map here, um, basically every location that is red is a location where we are predicting in the next, um, right now it's, I guess it would be about 85 years uh, that um, land will be lost. Okay, this is predictions of land loss in the year 2100. Okay, so we're facing a massive, massive problem in Louisiana as far as um, uh, you know, coastal communities, people who live, um, live in these environments um, and don't want to move, right? That's, that's home for them. So we would like to be able to use the stratigraphic record to tell us something about um, you know, the best way to manage this river delta to basically allow us to grow as much land through time as possible. 
This is an image here of the modern day um, uh, shape of the Mississippi River down near its outlet here um, uh, going into the Gulf of Mexico. Well, we can use images, these images from seismic data that I showed earlier on, to essentially um, query the subsurface, um, so let's just say, you know, uh, um, sediment that exists within the top kilometer or let's just say top mile beneath the Earth's surface, um, where there's all these packages of sediment that were deposited by the Mississippi River over, you know, um, a number of millions of years prior to today. So on here, it's, it's a little bit hard to see, but hopefully you can get the point that here's the shape of the modern um, Mississippi River. And in here, um, in this seismic data, in this CAT scan in the subsurface, you can see a shape of a river that is relatively similar to the modern day Mississippi River. And the point here is that there's all this treasure trove of data that exists in the subsurface in the delta for how the Mississippi River responded to past climatic events that could help us um, essentially inform us about how to best manage the river in modern day environments. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do down in, um, down in lower Louisiana and in New Orleans. Okay. So um, basically the, the topic that we're gonna be moving into next here um, essentially is an idea here of um, thinking about this stratigraphy as being some type of tape recorder that we're going to be able to use to pull out some story about what is, um, what's going on um, or what has happened in Earth's history. Okay, um, but, so here we have an image of the Grand Canyon and in the Grand Canyon we have some of the, the world's um, most studied uh, or best studied stratigraphy. You have all of these layers of rocks that people, you know, when they're rafting down the Grand Canyon or just sitting on the rim of the, uh, the Grand Canyon, um, you know, are able to look out in and, and see, you know, all the natural beauty that the world has here. Um, but the layering of rock that we have through here, each one of these layers of rock is, is containing within it some information about how the world was working at the time that that rock or that sediment that makes up that rock um, was deposited. And so that's essentially here going to be our tape recorder that we want to use in order to pull out some information about the Earth's history. However, one of the, I, I guess the title of my talk was um, stratigraphy being a flawed record, right? Um, and that's one of the things that I want to get into right now is um, why do I say that this record is a flawed record? And what I'll start off here um, and state is um, the way that I think about this stratigraphic record, all of these layers of rock here, is that in some way it's like the Watergate tapes, okay? Um, you've got information that's being stored and recorded in some tape recorder here, but there's a whole bunch of gaps within this record. Um, and there's gaps within this record because at certain time periods, you know, the Earth just doesn't want you to hear um, what it's doing within the Oval Office, okay? Um, at certain time periods, it wants you to hear what it's doing. Um, but this record is going to turn on and off here for a number of different reasons. Um, but that turning on and off of the, the tape recorder here is going to limit the amount of information that we're able to pull out of this stratigraphic record. It's going to limit the types of, of questions that we, um, that we can really address. And one of the things that we want to do as scientists is really just define sort of what the fidelity of this record is. You know, what types of questions can we actually answer as geologists and what types of questions can't we? Okay. So just to give you some idea of the way that, you know, the way that I do my science or think about my science, um, I spend a lot of time thinking about something that I call the stratigraphic filter. And the idea here that I'll just state is um, what we're doing essentially is trying to figure out how the Earth moves around. Dynamics on here I'm just getting at meaning um, how rivers move around on the Earth's surface. But those rivers, when they're moving around on the Earth's surface, for example, um, they're depositing some sediment and that sediment or that information goes through some filter here, surface processes, before it actually gets transferred into a record called stratigraphy that is sort of um, some, some augmented record of what was going on in the past um, that you get preserved here after it goes through something that I'm going to call the stratigraphic filter that is what I spend a lot of my time thinking and trying to figure out actually what this, what this coffee filter um, looks like and how it works. Another way to view sort of the, the science that I do um, to try to get across some of, um, you know, what we're, what we're facing and what is challenging to us 
um, is sort of uh, um, characterized here in, in this really uh, sort of generic equation. Um, this will be the only equation that I'll, I'll have to talk here, but um, essentially it's, there's a little bit of philosophy in, in the way that this is arranged here, which is essentially at the end of the day what stratigraphy is here um, is some component of these three factors that we have here. It's, um, it's somewhat controlled, the, the layering of the rocks that you see in the, um, in the Grand Canyon is somewhat controlled here by what the topography of the Earth's surface looks like. How deep are rivers? Um, basically, how wide are rivers? How large are sand dunes in the Sahara Desert? It's also controlled here by something um, that we're just going to say is net deposition. And what I mean by this is you need some amount of space to store the sediment in to start to accumulate this vast, vast thickness of sand that contains within it some type of stratigraphic record. If you don't have an environment where you can accumulate this really thick package of sediment, well, then you don't have any stratigraphy. And we're able here to get at long-term knowledge of how quickly an environment is building up layers of sand by different types of, of uh, um, radiometric dating tools, um, things that you might have heard of, of you know, essentially some things like carbon-14 dating or other different types of radiometric clocks that we're able to date rocks with. We're also here, we're able to go out and on um, the modern Earth's surface, we're able to characterize for many systems what rivers look like. One thing that we don't have a great understanding of here is this thing that I'm going to call kinematics, which really all this means is this topography, how does the topography move around? How do rivers move around? We can, we can sort of get at this question from modern systems. We have different types of dating techniques to get at this, but we don't have a really good understanding of this. Um, and the reason, well, because we don't have a great understanding of this, one of the things that we do um, is laboratory experiments, which I'll talk about in a little bit, which helps us understand how rivers move around and, and basically create stratigraphy through time. Okay? So I'm going to get, I'm going to go now into a couple of different um, uh, case studies, or not really case studies, but examples that could tell you why we have some problems with the stratigraphic record and why it has some resolution issues, okay? Why, it, why there are some problems that we just can't solve with stratigraphy. And so the first thing I'm going to talk about here is just this idea that the stratigraphic record is somewhat incomplete. You know, again, it's this tape recorder, it's the Nixon tape recorders where the, you know, the, the tape recorder is being turned on and off through time. So here I'd just like you to think about some type of environment, let's just say some type of coastal environment right now, where we have a river that's coming in and out of the plane of this little diagram that we have here, and it's going out to the ocean. Well, um, basically here, one of the problems that we have uh, is that stratigraphy um, that ends up de um, developing here, so you can see these layers of rock that are, we're depositing here um, at, in the ocean where maybe a river delta is forming. Well, um, these layers of rock are not laid down at a constant rate through time. Okay? Um, at some time periods, this river that is moving through the diagram here might actually erode into the Earth's surface. And when you erode into the Earth's surface, you're going to pick up grains of sand here, tear it out, and take it to a new location. Basically, you're eroding out some of the record. You know, you, maybe you're going into um, to, uh, your uh, tape recorder and you're cutting out snippets of that record. Okay? In addition to that, there are some sites on the Earth's surface right now where just no sediment is accumulating. You, know, you could walk outside here right now um, and stand on the ground and there's no sediment that is accumulating you know, at that location. There might not be sediment that accumulates there for a million years. But we could also go down to the Mississippi River Delta and stand at some locations on the side of the river and there's just no sediment being deposited. Okay, so there's no information being stored into the stratigraphic record. The record is somewhat incomplete for these types of purposes. And these are types of you know, questions that we're interested in is how much can erosion remove some of the record and how frequently to different locations on the Earth's surface um, have a river pass over them and actually deposit some sediment that, um, that could tell us some information about the Earth's history. The point being here is that you know, the record is, is really, really incomplete. Just, so just to give you an example of that, here's a movie from a laboratory experiment I've done um, at Tulane. And um, just to, to give you some info, a lot of the work that I do is trying to take environments like the Mississippi River 
and scale it down and put it into a lab. Okay, we're trying to basically build um, mini Mississippi River deltas or mini deltas in a very controlled lab environment. So here you have a movie um, where uh, basically we are watching the evolution of a small little delta in the lab, just to give you some scale, um, going from here to let's just say here is about three feet. So it's not a very big experiment, right? Um, but we're um, introducing water and sediment into the delta, uh, delta here. So basically we're making a little river and that river is building out into a small little ocean in the basin. Okay, so we're able here to monitor the evolution of um, this system through time and actually see you know, when, um, how many time periods does this river that is carved here end up eroding sediment from the record, removing some of uh, the completeness. Um, and also, you know, how long does it take for one location on the delta top here to, um, to be visited by flow um, and actually have a chance to record some, um, some deposition. Just to give you an idea, this experiment here runs for about a thousand hours um, and we run these experiments in our lab nonstop. It takes a couple of months to run where we always have a grad student or me in the lab. So uh, it's the great thing about, um, about graduate students um, and their time period at universities is you can convince them to do lots of crazy things. Um, but as this movie goes on here um, and we're essentially building this delta through time, once every hour of this thousand hour long experiment, we're making a measurement of um, what the surface of the experiment looks like. We've got an instrument that basically can capture the topography of the experiment. Um, essentially, you know, the elevations of land here. And that's what you're seeing evolve down here in this movie. This movie is essentially a cross section of the delta at about this location here. And you can see that into the stratigraphic record, the, there are these bodies here, these sort of smiley faces that you can see that are old locations of river channels. There's also floodplain material that's getting deposited on the sides of the river deltas. Um, but essentially, you know, this is the record that's left behind at the end of the day of all of these processes that are going on here. And one thing that I did not describe is that this experiment that you're looking at here, everything in this experiment is constant. Okay, so there's no sea level changes that are going on in the course of this experiment. The water and the sediment that are coming into the basin here is very, very constant through time. Yet you have all of these really, really interesting patterns about how a river moves around over the surface of the earth. And so you can think if you did have sea level fluctuations going on, so you know, sea level was dropping um, some 100 meters and then coming back up 100 meters, what type of signature would that leave in the rock record and how could we tear that signal out from all of this, one might just say, noise that's in the record. Okay? Point here, though, is that this experiment, I, I could say that essentially what this experiment is doing is it's modeling the evolution of a river delta, um, maybe let's just say over several, several million, uh, millions of years. Okay, so this would be, you know, you think about this evolution of this delta, this is what's going on for the Mississippi Delta or how dynamic the river delta is when you're at really, really, really long time scales. It takes some time for you know, the river to jump around and move to new locations, which I'm thankful for, otherwise it would be a more challenging environment for me to live in in New Orleans. Okay. Um, so within stratigraphy, essentially, you know, um, these different types of incompleteness that we have um, basically are represented here, um, or they end up uh, um, coming into our rock record in a number of different types of ways. Right? These periods of erosion that we talked about here, these are things that we end up calling disconformities. Okay? So essentially this erosion here tears out some of the record and then at some later time period you start depositing sediment on top of it. And so for example here, you might be out looking at, um, in the Grand Canyon, you're looking at um, layering of rock that is, is there, but there might be some surfaces in here where um, beneath that surface the rock is 100 million years old and above that surface, the rock is 50 million years old. Essentially, there's 50 million years of time that's all of a sudden just missing. And we want to understand, essentially, what controls that amount of time that's missing. Likewise, over here, you could just have surfaces, different surfaces of the Earth's surface here, um, where is, um, that surface is not receiving any sediment, so there's no deposition of sediment going on or no erosion. Um, and so associated with that, you might have layers down here that are 100 million years old, and then just since nothing was going on for 50 million years, all of a sudden right above that layer, the rock is 50 million years younger. 
So that's, you know, that's a lot of time missing, a lot of Earth's history that's missing that we would like to be able to have to really tell better stories about what was going on in the Earth's past. Okay. The, the other thing that I'll mention here, right, is um, these different types of unconformities or disconformities, these, these periods of missing time that we see in the rock record, they, they end up happening at very, very big scales and at very, very small scales over here. So if you look here, this is another image of the Grand Canyon right here, and we have layering of rock here that, um, that you could see, and this, um, these layers of rock that I'm pointing at right now, you can see that they're somewhat at an angle, and they come up terminating up against this layer of rock here. This is something in the Grand Canyon that we call the Great Unconformity. It's, um, it's you know, a very, very big unconformity that lots of people talk about when you stand in the Grand Canyon. And this unconformity here, um, I'm not actually uh, certain off the top of my head, but I think um, you know, you're missing several hundreds of millions of years worth of time when you are um, going from beneath this surface here, these layers of rock, and then when you go across that, across the great unconformity, all of a sudden your rocks are um, several, several hundreds of millions of years younger. But we also see that at very, very small scales. This is just my rock hammer um, down here, but we've got um, layering of rock here from just ripples and dunes that move through a river that cause periods of erosion here um, to come into uh, our stratigraphy at the end of the day. So these gaps in our record um, are at very, very small scales and are at very, very large scales. Okay. Um, the, the next problem that we have in the stratigraphic record um, uh, comes about by something here that I'm going to call the Sadler effect. Um, and basically, uh, I'm going to try to uh, do my best job of, of describing this effect because it's somewhat confusing. Um, but this effect, uh, basically, that I'm going to highlight here, um, it was uh, um, developed or quantified in the early 1980s by this individual, Pete Sadler. Um, and so it got named after him, even though Pete um, goes around now and he, he very much doesn't like the fact that you know, people have named this after him, but, um, but the name has stuck. Um, and basically what this is here, we have a diagram that I'm going to try to walk through over here. Um, and this diagram here, what it is, is it's a whole bunch of different measurements of how, um, how quickly we deposited a certain unit of rock. Okay, essentially what we're doing over here is we're dating a basal surface of a rock and a top surface of a rock and figuring out how much time did it take to lay down that sediment. Okay. And so what we have here is a bunch of measurements here of the rate of deposition, how quickly we're laying down sand. Um, and on the, the other axis, what we have here is a time span at which this measurement was done over. Okay? So you can think over on this portion of the diagram here, what we're talking about is actually going out to a river and over a one hour period figuring out how much sediment is being accumulated in the rock record. Um, and if you're over here, you're, what you're doing is you're looking at really, really big units of rock and you're trying to um, figure out for maybe some very big, thick deposit how much sand was laid down in that period of time. The point that I'll make here is what we see with this graph, again, this is a little bit confusing, but hopefully you'll follow me. Um, what we see with this graph, um, and this is an accumulation of um, tens and tens of thousands of, of measurements that we as um, geologists have been able to come up with, at many, many different locations on the Earth's surface is that as the amount of time that you um, measure a sedimentary deposit over increases, the rate of your net deposition decreases. Um, essentially what this means, let me try to boil this down to what this graph means. What it means is that it's very, very hard to take modern measurements, let's just say measurements of how quickly the Earth is changing over, let's just say, the last hundred years when we're experiencing maybe climate change, and compare that to what was going on maybe hundreds and hundreds of millions of years ago, because there's a dependency here on the um, rate at which you deposit sediment to the amount of time that you measured over. Now let me give you an example, you know, this, this might be confusing, might not be, but let me give you an example of, of a type of problem that this really throws a wrench into sort of um, the work that we wanted to um, try to do. This is an example diagram, or this is a, a diagram here of um, some measurement of the amount of sediment mass that has been deposited on, um, on Earth going back um, from present day conditions back to, let's just say, 60 million years ago. Okay, and what we see on here is this big, um, uh, you know, this big uh, uh, rapid amount or large amount of sediment mass 
that is being deposited, let's just say, over the last five or so million years here. One way to interpret this graph, okay, so we're going back in time as you go in the, this direction. One way to interpret this graph is that something different has been going on in the last, um, the last five million years in comparison to the rest of the Earth's history. There's some difference here. Maybe um, climate has been warming really rapidly over the last five million years, and that's causing us to erode more sediment and deposit it at some other location. Um, or maybe, um, maybe mountains are building faster these days in comparison to what they did in, in Earth's past. And because of that, we're eroding those mountains more quickly and depositing a lot more sediment recently. Right? Like this looks different than everything over here. But what the Sadler effect says here is that if you look at things that are um, deposited more um, in time periods that are um, relatively shorter time periods, um, they have a higher amount of a deposition rate or a larger deposition rate than things that were deposited over many, many, many million years. So the idea here basically is, is that this signal that we see here might not be some type of climatic signal or it might not be some type of change in the rate at which mountains are uplifting. It might just be an artifact of the way a sediment transport system um, works or how rivers move around. So the point that I'd like you to take home here is that there's, there's challenges to actually working with this record that have to do with essentially how rivers move around um, through time that makes it very, very hard and challenging for us to go in and actually make measurements of the rock outcrop and um, definitively say something um, uh, you know, about what was going on in, um, in Earth's history. Um, so um, another avenue of, of research that I'm involved in that um, basically we're trying to, again, uh, increase the fidelity at which we can use layers of rock like what you see here out in the, uh, in the American West um, to tell us something about, uh, um, you know, about Earth's history. Um, one of the areas of research that I've been uh, heavily involved in is trying to tell the difference between these two words up here as far as what they relate to. Um, to uh, the generation of stratigraphy. First word up here is something I'm going to call autogenic processes. And what these are here, um, you can think about that river delta that we were looking at in that uh, movie from the laboratory experiment I had earlier in the talk where the river was moving around through time. And it was doing all of that in the absence of changes in sea level. There were a lot of dynamics to the system even though boundary conditions weren't changing. And those processes are things here that I call autogenic processes. And they differ from things here that I call allogenic forcings, which are changes in, in uh, um, things that I call boundary conditions, namely what sea level is, how sea level is changing, how, uh, um, how rapidly mountains are being uplifted that are providing sediment to, um, sediment to uh, construct this stratigraphy. Okay? So um, all of these processes here add noise into our record that makes it hard to actually tell the signal of these things that we want to be able to use stratigraphy for. So a lot of my work ends up being um, uh, um, centered around these types of processes to better define them, to better help us filter these types of things out of the record so that we can read changes in Earth's climate um, through looking at rocks like this. Got some type of malfunction here. One second. <laughs> if anybody knows a good joke, um, now's the time for it as well. The computer has. Okay, um, let's see. I can try to uh, let this hopefully advance in a second. I've never had this before. Um, okay, so I will, um, I'll try to just go um, without slides for the rest of the talk, um, make it through and, and try to um, give people an idea of, um, of what I do. So I'm talking here about all these autogenic processes and allogenic forcings, and maybe at some point here my computer would advance. But um, basically what I try then to do is to go into a laboratory environment to try to basically be able to quantify all of these um, types of autogenic processes here. 
Um, and so I spend, as you saw that movie earlier, a lot of time in the laboratory environment. And I work in a laboratory environment for a number of different types of reasons. There's lots of types of geologists that are out there. Um, many of us end up working, going out to modern environments like the Mississippi River Delta, and we try to collect as much data about how the Mississippi River um, works and moves around in time. Or there's people who go and they look at glacier, um, glaciers, glacial deposits, um, look at how mountains uplift through time. Um, I spend a lot of my time, though, rather than um, uh, going out to field sites, I spend a lot of my time working in a lab environment. And we go into a lab environment for a number of different reasons to try to track, make a lot of these problems that we're looking at here tractable. Um, one of those reasons why, and basically, I, um, if the slide were to pop up, what I had in here was um, basically a slide that said, here are my list of problems with the real world. Okay? Um, and my list of problems of the real world, which is why I do laboratory experiments to solve a lot of these problems, is that um, the real world for me ends up being so large and big. It's, it's a very, very large world that we live in. And what that means is that it makes it very, very challenging for geologists to go out for, say, the Mississippi River Delta and to be able to collect data on the Mississippi River to really characterize how it works. Just because it's so big, it's really hard to comprehensively monitor a system like that. In addition to that, um, the, the real world evolves relatively slowly. Okay? Um, we have dramatic climate change going on right now on, on Earth, but at the same point, you know, over a, uh, a human lifespan living on the Mississippi River Delta, um, we might have the Mississippi River do something that we call an avulsion, which is a dramatic change in the location of the Mississippi River. That might, if I was lucky or not lucky, that might happen once in my lifetime. The point being that, you know, even in really dynamic locations on the Earth's surface, um, the Earth is evolving very, very slowly. Um, and so going into a lab environment allows us to build smaller um, systems that allows us to, um, to be able to speed up the rate at which the system works because as you scale it down, generally the key processes that work um, uh, to evolve the system speed up. The other reason that I go into the lab is if you are interested in studying how, um, how the real world works and how maybe the Mississippi um, River Delta evolves in time, well, the Mississippi River uh, Delta is being influenced by a number of different parameters. How sea level is changing, how much sediment is coming down the Mississippi River, um, and that supply of sediment for us down in Mississippi, um, or uh, for the Mississippi River Delta, has been changing through time because we've put all of these really great large big dams on um, things like the Ohio River or, or um, portions of the tributaries on the Ohio River or different locations on the Mississippi River, we've dammed that river up at a number of locations which ends up storing sediment behind these dams. So associated with that, we have changes in the amount of sediment that are coming down the Mississippi River that could get deposited um, to help build the delta. What I'm getting at is that there's all these competing types of variables that are changing at the same time and for us as scientists, that's, it, it makes it a tricky problem to work with. And if you go into the lab, what you can do is only um, essentially allow one variable to change through time. Okay? Um, so for all those reasons, essentially a lot of the, the study or a lot of, uh, of the work that I end up doing um, is related to going into the lab and trying to make these miniature systems so that we can monitor all of the processes associated with them. Um, now, the, the laborata um, laboratory experiments, I, yeah. um, it seems, one second, we'll try to get this back. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Magic, great. <laughs> well, hopefully people were following me up to that point, were following what I was saying without the visuals. Um, 
basically everything that I was going through there was what, um, what I have for the next couple of slides here, okay? Let me just look at where we are in time. Um, and basically, experimental stratigraphy, we're trying to essentially um, take small systems, make them in the lab, but do them with controlled conditions, okay? So this is what I was saying. What, what I do a lot is build small deltas on a larger delta system. And here's my list of problems with the real world that I was, uh, I was just informing everybody about. And again, the great thing about laboratory experiments being that they evolve fast, um, they're small enough so that we can really comprehensively monitor these things. And as a scientist, it's really great for me because I can control individual variables. And all these laboratory experiments that you're seeing, that you uh, saw movies of, and that we'll see more movies of here in a second, help inform us with the construction of um, numerical models that would allow us to uh, essentially probe or question different types of forcings that the Earth might feel in the future. So here's just another movie here of one of the experiments in our lab. Again, we're building a delta here, introducing water and sediment up here, and uh, um, all that water and sediment is being transported down to an ocean down here. Now, in this, um, in this experiment, what we have over here is at a number of different cross-sections to the experiment, we were monitoring how the topography was evolving through time. And that's what you see over here. This essentially is looking, this movie here, is looking at the generation of stratigraphy. All of these lines that you have in this diagram over here are essentially old locations of the Earth's surface that have been transferred into the stratigraphic record over here. And the idea that I'd like, um, or the, the thing that I'll get across to all of you, um, is that you have the, the surface here of um, this experiment is moving around through time by river channels that are migrating around. They erode out some sediment at certain um, time periods. Um, also, you have certain locations where nothing is happening. But in a long-term sense, all these surface processes are constructing the architecture of all of the, um, the subsurface layers of rock. Okay? The other point about that um, on here is we could think here if you were at one location on the delta top over here and you were monitoring how that elevation of the delta top was going up and down through time. Well, here is just a, um, uh, something I'll call a time series here. We have a diagram on the x-axis here is time moving forward as this experiment's going on. And the y-axis over here is elevation. And you can see that the record is going up and down, up and down, up and down through time. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're left with in stratigraphy are just the time periods where it's gone up, but there has not then been a successive time period of erosion that is able to cut down and remove a portion of that record. So this is a laboratory experiment where we're able to monitor all these ups and downs here, um, and you know, we're able to construct these types of time series, but then we're able to actually quantify for this experiment, okay, um, what fraction of the history of this experiment's surface processes are left behind and are recorded at the end of the day in the stratigraphy. And you know, I'll, I'll um, summarize it here by just saying that a, a relatively short fraction of the evolution of the Earth here, um, this, you know, this small representation of the Earth, is left behind in the record here. But what we're interested in is um, trying to understand the controls of how complete this record is. Okay. So um, one of the things that we found is uh, essentially one of the controls that uh, um, uh, sets how complete this record is um, ends up being here um, a property that I'll talk about, um, which is going to be something that I'll call sediment cohesion. And essentially what this is is just how sticky is the sediment that's coming in to build your river delta. Okay, in this last movie that I had over here, we had an experiment where um, essentially this sediment was rather, rather not sticky. It, it didn't have any stickiness to it. Um, and stickiness, what you can think about this in the real world, what I'm talking about, is if you deal with a, a river system that is transporting a lot of clay material, really, really fine grained sediments, clay material ends up being relatively sticky. Um, it's so small that it ends up binding to a lot of other um, uh, types of grains relatively easily. Another thing that brings in this factor called cohesion is vegetation. Um, roots of, say, trees or, or plants end up helping to bind sediment grains together. So that experiment was an experiment that didn't have any sticky sediment. Here we have an experiment where we have a lot of stickiness to the sediment that is building the delta here. You can think about going down to the Mississippi River. The um, Mississippi River has a lot of vegetation and it's a, it's a very warm climate down there. It's a subtropical climate. 
And associated with that, you have a lot of vegetation that um, basically brings in cohesion to the river system. And you're able then to uh, essentially build rivers that are able to stick really, really far out into the, receive, uh, out into the ocean. Okay. So here's just a sequence of three different movies from three different experiments that we've been able to run in the lab, um, in my lab at Tulane. All of these experiments have exactly the same conditions associated with them, except this delta that we're building over here, ha again, has no stickiness to the sediment. And as we go um, uh, towards the, the right on this slide over here, essentially we're increasing the amount of stickiness in the, um, in the river deltas that we move. And you can see that it has a dramatic effect essentially on how the rivers are moving around through time and how um, the, the shapes of the river deltas here and how they're creating this, uh, this stratigraphic record. Okay? So just to think about this, you can think about the Mississippi River Delta here. Um, and uh, um, this is a, a view actually from the space station of Louisiana. You're looking down from the space station. And you can see this, um, this arm of the Mississippi River here that's reaching all the way out into the Gulf of Mexico, really, really far away um, uh, relative to the rest of the shoreline here. This you could think about as being a system that's really, really sticky, or it has a lot of vegetation. And this over here, this is something, uh, this is the Slinga, um, or not Slinga, it's uh, uh, the Lena River Delta in Russia up in the Arctic Ocean, um, a location where there's not much vegetation because it's so cold, right? We're building a river delta here out into uh, the Arctic Ocean. And this delta um, is sort of much, much more fan-shaped here because it's, it has less um, vegetation and it makes it less sticky. So these are some of the controls on what a river delta um, ends up looking like, um, the, the sort of dominant players in constructing our stratigraphic record. Okay. So some of the things that we're learning on here um, are these internal processes really have a big, strong control on how complete our record is and, and what types of information we're able to pull out. Things like increasing sediment cohesion, increasing things that I'll talk about, or um, that I'll just call the uh, strength of tectonics here, or versus sediment that's moving through a river. All of these things here end up controlling these autogenic processes, essentially how rivers flopping around um, on a river delta, um, and end up basically putting gaps into our record here um, uh, that uh, limit the fidelity of the stratigraphic record. So uh, I'm going to close here. This is my last slide. Um, and basically, uh, some of the points that I, I hope that you got away from the, the talk that I went through tonight um, is that stratigraphy, at the end of the day, um, if we're interested in um, the Earth's history, which is you know, over four, um, 4 billion years old, if we're interested in probing how the Earth has evolved through time, Really, what we're talking about is, is um, going into geology, and specifically, really, um, the best record that we might have as geologists is this thing that we call stratigraphy, or these layers of sedimentary rocks that are constructed by river deltas, and then at some other later point might be uplifted to the Earth's surface for us to see them. But these layers of rock here that basically um, uh, tell us the grand story of, of the Earth and its four billion year history, there's lots of gaps in this record, um, and there are lots of gaps in it for a number of different reasons that basically limit the types of questions that we're able to pose. And um, where my research group really works hard um, trying to develop theory for and an understanding of how the world works, it's basically trying to put limits on the fidelity of that record, basically trying to inform the community of um, what are the limits at, uh, of the types of questions that we're going to be able to ask of the Earth's um, history? Because certain questions or certain things about the Earth's history have just been lost to time due to the processes of erosion or non-deposition. So we want to basically create tractable problems, problems that we as Earth scientists can go out and solve. Um, but in order to do that, we need to understand the limits of the stratigraphic record here um, and what controls those limits. Um, so with that, um, I'm done, and I'm happy to take any questions from, um, from anybody who's in the room here. Thank you so much, Dr. Straub. If we can give a hand of applause. <laughs> and I'll pass on the mic to anyone who has a question.
Hi. Uh, although you didn't talk about it directly, I was curious. Uh, could you share with us, um, kind of uh, explain how VARVs are specifically formed? And I'm curious, um, how accurate can VARVs be used in, term in terms of determining Earth time? And is there any direct correlation with global temperature and the formation of VARVs? You're, you're saying VARVs with a B, right? Uh, with a V. Okay. There's bars and there's also bars. <laughs> Thank you. Right? Um, okay. So uh, bars, what we're getting at here basically um, are uh, uh, large packets of sediment that might be moving down a river as some type of coherent structure. Right? Um, and so um, bars, there's, there's different types of, of deposits that you get in stratigraphy that can tell you about different types of surface processes. You know, we talk to some degree in um, going through the lecture here about channel deposits. Um, but within those channels, there's these packages of sediment that move, um, that move as, as bars. Um, and these things are um, really dominantly, they're completely, I would say, within the realm of sort of autogenic processes um, in a river. They're, um, they're internally generated, uh, um, uh, what we call self-organization in, in a river. Essentially, um, one of the things that I find really, really interesting about the earth is that there's different processes that um, act in the earth that uh, um, br take you from something that might be relatively disorganized billions upon billions of grains of sand and you can get processes that come or um, forms that come out of that self-organization. Things about ripples or dunes um, that move through a, a river. Um, so see getting back to your question what controls um, the, the formation of those um, uh, some of the things that control the formation of those are just the scale of eddies that might be moving through a river and what controls sort of that turbulence at which um, water moves through a river, the depth of the river, the width of the river, um, the amount of vegetation that you have within the river. Again, if you have a, a very, very wide river, you can construct something that we would call a braided channel. Um, and that, in that braided channel, when it's really wide relative to its depth, you can get all these bars that move through it. Um, as far as climate change is concerned, that was the, the last part of your question, right? Um, are, do bars respond to climate change? Um, and basically what I would say there is, um, to some degree they do, in the sense that if you have climate change and um, you dramatically change the amount of precipitation that is going on in some uh, environment that's changing the amount of water in your river, um, well, that's going to feed back on how individual particles of sediment are moving through the river, and this, it will essentially affect the size of the bar features that you get. Um, within a, a river and um, basically then how sediment is transported down that funnel. Do we have any other question? Uh, I've got several questions if people, other people sure. don't. But um, I was wondering, you're still doing physical experiments and uh, I was wondering, well, I'll ask my, I guess my three questions and then sure. you can answer them. Um, you're using, doing physical experiments, and I was wondering if you're using computers to simulate these experiments, or if, they, if they, your, your experimental models match what, what a computer would project from the same initial conditions. Um, my second question is, uh, you mentioned vegetation affecting the, the, how the streams are formed. Uh, is there any way to uh, mimic that in your experiments? Do you plant, put grass seeds or algae or anything in there to and I was one, sure. wasn't quite sure how the plants were affecting the streams. Were they making the banks more coherent, m uh, uh, more tied together so the stream couldn't move as much? I wasn't quite sure how the vegetation was affecting the um, uh, stream. And I guess that my third question is how the, if you set up your experiment as close as you can, each time, two, two times in a row or ten times in a row, do the does it, what do your results look like over time? Do they vary dramatically like a chaotic situation or do or they turn out very similar? Okay, um, those are all great questions. So uh, um, let me tackle them one by one. Um, the sci science is a, a very collaborative um, enterprise, right? Um, you have different people who are really good at doing certain things, um, but via collaborations you get a, you know, you get much much more um, uh, um, bang for your buck than you know, just what individual people are doing. And one of the great examples I always think about um, with this, it sort of gets to your first question, is um, there was all this news, uh, um, I believe it was like 18 months or so ago, maybe more than that, two years ago, with the, um, something that people were calling the Higgs bosom. 
um, which was this, this, it's been called the God particle within the physics community. Um, and basically, uh, the, the sort of um, process of coming to an understanding of this God particle that physicists, um, you know, they, they don't actually like it being called the God particle, um, but uh, coming to an understanding and getting experimental data to actually prove this theory was a, was a long time in the coming, but it started off with people who are with Peter, Peter Higgs and another individual who doesn't get as much credit as he should, and I'm not remembering his name right now, who developed the theory right around the same time. So, um, so sorry for what, whoever your name is. Um, but uh, um, Peter uh, basically developed a lot of this theory. Um, uh, um, basically, you know, in a way you could just say sitting in his office. He was, he's a theorit, um, theorit, theoretician, if I can get the word out of my mouth. Um, he doesn't do laboratory experiments, right? He, that's not his specialty. Um, but there are people who are really, really good at putting together, um, using billions of dollars to create particle accelerators in Switzerland, in, um, border of Switzerland and France, to test this theory. And it took, you know, many, many years to do that. But um, without the experiments, Peter Higgs's theory you know, would be much, uh, would be, you know, wouldn't be as strong as if you had actually the experimental data. Um, so I do laboratory experiments. I also do numerical models. Um, I don't do as much field collection um, as uh, generating models and, uh, um, generating models and doing laboratory experiments, numerical models and laboratory experiments. Um, but I also work with a, a bunch of people who are really way better than I am at going out to rocks and getting information out of them. Um, so that's, that's the first one. Um, the second one uh, was vegetation, is that correct? Um, and whether or not we can do that in the lab. Um, what I'll show there real quickly. Come back here. Um, this is a laboratory experiment that was performed at the University of Minnesota over here. So this is, you know, you could think this is about six um, feet in width. And this is an experiment where they were introducing water and sediment to uh, something we call a flume. Um, basically just passes water and sediment down through this slot. Um, and basically what they did here is they ran a set of experiments where they had no vegetation in their experiments at all. And what you got in this flume was just a really wide braided channel here. Um, water and sediment would, been, would have been covering the entire width of the basin here. Um, but it was a, a braided river, really, really shallow depths and really wide. And then what they did is they started to grow alfalfa um, in their, their experiments. They brought in some grow lights um, and uh, um, basically allowed this system to evolve um, with, uh, um, with these alfalfa plants, which sort of scale to uh, um, what a tree would be like um, if you were to scale it up. Um, and that ended up having dramatic effects here where um, rather than the flow covering everywhere, you started to just get these single threads here of a river that would go down through, um, through the system. So this works at a lab scale as well. Um, and your third question, I I'm, 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 can't remember. I can't remember what. Yep, um, so uh, another um, good question. Um, what I would say is uh, um, essentially, if, you, if I were to um, take a shovel and dig out all that sediment from my, my basin and run the exact same experiment again, um, it, would look, it would look different and the time sequencing of, ev of events would be different. But, on a, um, but if you were to analyze the data in a statistical way, um, the statistics of the experiment would be the same. And what you can get at there is you could think of, okay, let's just think about a, a typical summer within Cincinnati and the range of temperatures that you have here. Well, um, if you have one summer and you compare that to the next summer one year later, well, your starting condition is going to be somewhat different, but you're being forced